Greetings and salutations, ladies and gentlemen. And we are back for episode three of the Borderless Podcast. Hey, this hey. Is, <laughs> that is Ben. And I'm Ali. <laughs> um, and uh, today we have a very, very interesting guest for you guys um, who's going to tell us a little bit about the uh, country of Cuba, which I know a lot of Americans are interested in want to go to, want to visit, and it's right here. It's our neighbor right next to us. Uh, and our guest today, because of the current political climate in Cuba, um, he's going to remain anonymous. So, Ben, we're, we're not going to know who he is or where exactly he is, name, face, nothing like that. That's but, uh, right. It's important to conceal his identity for this interview, but we do appreciate having Mr. X on the show. Right. And... Uh, you know, to, to, to you guys, he'll be Mr. X. To me, um, he's he's more than that uh, because yeah, uh, you guys we have actually, back, don't you? <laughs> we do, we do. We've actually met, and um, and you know, I I went to Cuba at one point, um, and I was able to see the country. This was part of the grand tour, and Cuba was very interesting to me because, like I said, it's a neighbor of America. Ben, you've probably wanted to go to Cuba at some point. Been wanting to go for a very long time, but uh, travel restrictions have made it difficult. Yeah, when I went, it was it was Obama. You know, that was that was the time when um, all of those restrictions were eased a little bit. But you know, the the guy after him <laughs> changed things up a little bit. Oh yeah. So uh, you know, it it is what it is. Now we have a different president, so hopefully tensions will will ease up a little more, so people can visit this beautiful country again. But anyway, enough talking about that. Let's let's introduce uh, Mr. X, and um, I'll just let him take it away. Go ahead, sir. Tell us a little bit about um, about so, your, your your life. Go ahead. Good afternoon, first of all. Um, it's a pleasure for me. Uh, you invite me to your program, your radio program. Uh, I'm Cuban, as you said before, and Cuba is a wonderful country. We have a good, we have good people, you know, very solidary people. We are uh, very happy people and helpful. We help each other, you, you know, with no interest, but we don't have anything to do with the government. They say that we have a blockade, but in the real fact, we don't have any blockade because they are using American dollars, you know, and it's very difficult for Cuban uh citizens to get American dollars. To get food, we must have American dollars. So it's crazy indeed, you know, very high prices. A package of chicken, it costs 200 Cuban pesos. That is like $10. And for Cuban people, it's very difficult. And you have to buy food in the black market. So... That's the situation, big situation we're living right now. I don't know if you ha have seen a video of Castro's uh, grandson driving like a Mercedes Benz of this year. And he, after that, he uh, asked forgiveness to all the Cuban people abroad and in Cuba. You know, they don't have any, they don't have face. I have a, a question in regards to, you just mentioned Castro's grandson asking for forgiveness. Uh, when I was there in Cuba, um, this was the, the first day of my, of my trip, three years traveling. But I remember that night when I was in my hotel after roaming around a little bit outside, the TV showed me Raul Castro sitting at the desk in Spanish saying that Fidel Castro had just passed away. And me thinking, yeah. this is absolutely crazy. I just got here to Cuba. It's the first day of my trip. I don't know how long I'm going to be gone. And Fidel Castro dies on, on the first night. What a way and to start the trip. That was nuts, man. I, I was this can't be possible. This is a dream. But I went downstairs. I went outside. Um, I was trying to interview people outside of this club had just closed down next to the hotel. And these young people were coming out crying and sad and to me, it was a shock because I was thinking, I thought people didn't like this guy. I thought that he had put Cubans through torture and misery all these years and pain. And But I met Mr. X that night. 
you know, we, we met and we hung out and he showed me the Havana and he told me what's going on, the reality. And my question to you after all of that background, uh, Mr. X, is what is your opinion then if Fidel's uh, grandson is asking for forgiveness and you have lived your whole life under this regime that has um, unfortunately made life very hard for you, what is your opinion of Fidel and do you forgive his grandson and his family? So uh, really, he didn't have anything to do with uh, when he was in the power. He didn't like uh, their family had uh, a lot of power, you know, like other generals and other commandants that their uh, sons and daughters, they, they do have big power, you know. They, they were the owners of uh, big restaurants here, uh, the main businesses here, you know. He had a party to all their grandsons of the power and their, their own sons. So in the 80s, he was creating a city that it was a nuclear city, you know, that where he invested like millions of dollars, you know, and he saw his son, Fidel Castro Jr. He, he commit a suicide by himself uh, like three years ago, and he uh, quit the power to the to to his son because he was stealing a lot of millions of dollars. He didn't take he didn't take him to prison, but he quit of the power. So for me, he has been better than the other ones. It's not the same with Raul. It's not the same with this new one, Miguel Diaz Canel. You know, it's not it's not the same. That's so you like the you like the current guy? Um, the current guy? I don't like anyone. <laughs> okay, just wanted to be clear. I, I didn't choose him. No one likes him. What's your opinion of Fidel, though? I mean, I know that was a few years ago now, but when he passed away, were you sad like those people that I saw coming out of the club crying? Or what, what was your opinion of Fidel at that time? I wasn't sad, but uh, of this regime, he has been the better. You know, he has been the better one. You know, Cuban people was better when he was at the power. He wouldn't have permitted what we are living right now because we had better economy, much better. It's not the same like now that uh, to buy, for example, uh, one pound of ham is 100 Cuban pesos. That is $4, you know? For Cuban people that we don't earn enough, is it's crazy, you know? How much it's, do you earn in one day? What is like the average earnings for an average Cuban? Well, now now they 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 rise top the the salaries. Now the average of the salary right now is per month. Before it was like twenty dollars. Okay, the average salary now is uh three thousand Cuban pesos. That is uh, equivalent to a hundred and fifty dollars. But they rise up the prices, you know. They did it that, but they rise up the prices. We have a big inflation here. We have the most expensive electricity. If you have air conditioning in your house, you can pay uh, two thousand or three thousand Cuban pesos per month for your electricity. And if you don't pay it, they come here and they cut it down. So, so electricity is really a luxury to those who can afford it. A big luxury. Even for me, it's a big luxury. I have a, a, an air conditioning, but I don't use it. I just use uh, fans, you know, and the another uh, electro electrodomestics, but... And how so much does that, how, how much is your electricity bill then? Since it sounds like you found a, a, a way to sort of have... 700. The 50, 750 Cuban pesos, 800 Cuban pesos, or that's $30, like $30, $30 US, yeah. Dollars, very expensive. So do you guys, um, like within your family, do you guys pool your money together? How, how Do you live in like bigger family groups in one home? Like how, how do you get by? I, I keep my family by my own. 
I keep my family by my own. And mm -hmm. I have received it from abroad, you know. Friends who help me, you know. For example, you want to help me now, you want to send me something, uh, you help me. Um, I have many friends. That's how I, I have survived. And many Cubans have survived. But besides that, there are people who work in uh, restaurants, who work in another jobs. Uh, Cuban people here live stealing, stealing from the government, uh, from the government, from the you know, from their works. They're stealing. Stealing, yeah. Just to survive. For example, uh, a guy who works in a restaurant. Uh, you know, uh, he left two pounds of uh, flesh, they steal it. Uh, vegetables, they steal it, you know, and that's how they survive, you know. Wow. Wow. And if I they mean, get caught. It's a big shame. My, my, my question now is, um, how has coronavirus affected the situation are things worse since the pandemic started yeah it has affected so much no no tourism no no food no medicines we don't have medicines here zero medicines we what do you do if somebody gets sick we have to cure by ourselves by ourselves or to buy the medicines at the black market and where they're probably more expensive, right? Very expensive. Would you say that because antibiotics are expensive or food is expensive or everything has become more expensive, um, has this resulted in, in bad outcomes? Has this resulted in people dying when they shouldn't die from a common disease or people starving? Um, have that's you seen? Not, yeah. That's not the, the, big, uh, the big achievement we have. Cuban people is very solidarity, you know, uh, we have a uh, family, we have uh, cousins, we have uh, uncles, aunts, and everybody here shares their food. There's no problem, no problem by that, you know. There are people who are starving, you know, who are, they are from vagabonds, but we have it, but here no one dies of hunger, no one. Cuba has one of the strongest primary care systems in the world. They're they're known for that. It's paid for by the government. Um, but how? But you're saying that it's hard to access medicines, though. So even if they can go to the doctor, even if you have a lot of good primary care doctors and high quantity, people are still having trouble getting the actual treatment. Is what you're saying yeah. because it's too expensive, right? Yeah. Expensive and, and, so, and so many times we don't have the medicines. You know, this, this brings up, Ben, you know, we have to ask about America's effect on Cuba. You know, we think back to the history of Fidel, you know, the revolution with Che Guevara and uh, everything yeah. that happened after that with JFK and the Bay of Pigs and Cuban Missile Crisis, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's led to what Cuba is today. Uh, America can't wash their hands of that completely, right? Um, and I, I worry that, um, that it's only going to get worse if America doesn't step up and try to help um, in productive ways that do not hold the people of Cuba accountable for the government's actions because the people are, they, they didn't choose to do the things that the government did that America opposes. Um, Mr. X, do you have anger towards America in regards to the sanctions and everything over the years or? With Obama, it was much better. When Obama opened here, you know, many Cubans were uh, earning a lot of cash per month, you know? for being Cuban, 700, 800 bucks per month, uh, and much more. Wow, you know? that's 700 US dollars per month. We used to work with a tourist, you know, they were earning that. And that brings up a good point. Uh, so tourism really was your primary uh, GDP. I mean, that that's really where a lot of the money came from, correct? Yeah, of, of the tourism. 
Okay. Because people working at a restaurant just to sustain some sort of a living, they're really not making it. But in tourism, you're finding that people could really make money before Trump. Of course. Of I course. see. Um, and this actually brings me to my next question um, in regards to interacting with tourists. Uh, you and I became friends uh, back then when I came, and we hung out outside of my group, and we spent time together along with uh, another friend. And I remember that you guys told me at that time that you could get in trouble for actually spending time with me. The government, if they found out that you were friends with a American tourist, a foreigner, that you could potentially either go to jail or something else could happen. I don't know how true any of this is, but maybe you can expound on that. Yeah, um, they say to you, they have a law that they say that you are disturbing the tourists. I mean, they, they send you to a court and in the court, they sentence you with four years or five years and you go to jail because of that. And there are many people who are in jail by now because of that. You know, that's against human rights. Just just for befriending someone outside the country. Just for befriending of someone who lives out of the country. If you're American, more, much more. Mm. Do you think it's because they don't want you guys to be exposed to the knowledge of these people so that you don't want to leave the country? Like, what's the reason? They don't want we be exposed to the knowledge. Now we have internet. Now it's different. Now we have 4G LTE since uh, 2019. We have it. But now they, uh, they, don't, they didn't want the, the knowledge of the Cuban people. They didn't want a gift of friends, you know, who, who used to help Cuban people because of the poorness that we have here or, or, or normal. In there, you are friends and we, you can uh, exchange, uh, for example, presents. That's something normal. Let's see it right now with uh, Joe Biden. He's reviewing uh, his political to Cuba. Let, let's see. I, I, I hope that tourists at least came back to Cuba. Now we have this situation of, uh, of coronavirus. It's, you know, it's unfortunate that Cuba is such an amazing country. You know, I, I rode in some of those 1950s convertibles when I was there. We went to the, um, the Havana rum factory and it's an amazing culture. It's an amazing country. Uh, it's unfortunate that uh, more people can't see it and that you guys can't come and show your personalities to the rest of the world. Um, I, I think you're one of the most progressive people that I met on my trip, you know, and I went to 70 something countries and a lot of people, I think in America, uh, don't know that, uh, the Cubans who are still in their country, um, have these kinds of progressive forward thinking mentalities. It's, it's good to hear it from somebody's perspective who actually lives there. So. Thanks, man. Uh, really appreciate it. Ben, do you have any last questions or thoughts or anything? Uh, the whole thing is just very eye-opening to me, and I just appreciate you taking the time to share your experience with us today. Thanks a lot. It was all my pleasure. Um, you can count on me for whatever thing you need here in Cuba. Thanks, man. Good pleasure. I think we'll, we'll probably try to have you back at some point uh, if, if you're free. I know you're a busy man trying to make things happen there for your family. Um, yeah. We'll definitely love to have you back. And um, stay tuned, everybody, for our next episode, which will likely be out in another week or so. Um, and we're going to travel around the world again. And this time we're going to go to the land of India, where we are going to talk to one of my other uh close friends that I, I met on the trip, but also uh, beforehand, um, who actually is uh, very near and dear to me. And he has a very interesting story to tell about the uh, life in the slums of New Delhi. All right. Bon voyage. See you guys later. Take care, everybody.